Diagnostics are more advanced than ever before, yet bloodstream infections and sepsis are still a leading cause of death, claiming the lives of 11 million people each year worldwide. Identifying and treating symptoms of bloodstream infections quickly and effectively can significantly impact patient mortality. To find out how you can make a difference by partnering with BD, go to BD.com. A very warm welcome to our worldwide audience to the third session of our online World Sepsis Conference. This session is in the form of a panel discussion. We have five esteemed panelists who will present an initial statement and uh, then we'll discuss how the knowledge from COVID-19 can improve sepsis care and vice versa. I thank the sponsors, especially BD, uh, for sponsoring this session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Janet Diaz. She'll uh, speak about uh, why severe COVID-19 belongs under the umbrella of sepsis. Dr. Diaz is an accomplished specialist in pulmonary and critical care medicine with an expertise in global health. She heads the World Health Organization Health Emergencies Program since 2018 that is responsible for readiness and response to emerging infections like uh, COVID-19 and Ebola. I think her greatest achievements are developing the COVID-19 living guidelines on therapeutics and clinical management, spearheading the oxygen access scale-up initiative and advancing clinical research agenda around the emerging infectious diseases, especially involving low and low middle income countries. Welcome, Dr. Diaz. Thanks so much, Madiha, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening, colleagues. It is a pleasure to be here. So I have a few things to say about COVID-19 and sepsis. Uh, First, um, the spectrum of disease or the disease severity has evolved over time, with estimates uh, of severe critical COVID-19 decreasing, likely as a result of vaccination, previous immunity, the evolution of the virus, and optimization of clinical care interventions such as supportive care and therapeutics. However, with a highly transmissible virus that is changing, evolving, uh, a significant population at risk, and that we continue to see preventable deaths and excess morbidity. In the past 24 hours on our website, there has been nearly 3,000 deaths reported to WHO from COVID-19. That is totaling since the beginning of the pandemic over 6 million deaths, more than 500 million cases globally. As well noting that over 11 billion doses of vaccines have been delivered, but various parts of the world continue to have vulnerable populations that remain at risk. Sepsis is a common pathway of morbidity and mortality in COVID-19. Evidence continues to emerge about the dysregulated host immune response leading to acute organ dysfunction and shock. Multi-system involvement is well described, affecting not only the respiratory system or the lungs, but also the neurologic, cardiovascular, renal system, amongst others. But what does this mean? Now in the times of COVID-19, integrated sepsis clinical care pathways need to include care for COVID-19. And in converse, COVID-19 care pathways need to include care for sepsis. The first step is initial early recognition and identification, screening, triage, and rapid testing necessary for those presenting with acute respiratory illness, for sign, looking for signs of sepsis, as well as for the possible pathogen, in this case, COVID-19, but not just limited to COVID-19. We will start seeing again influenza and other uh, serious respiratory pathogens as populations and the public has opened up. Early antivirals for at-risk populations do not wait for sepsis to occur. Antiviral options now exist. There's evidence that has been produced a lot over the past couple of months that early disease, those at highest risk would benefit. And that means patients who are unvaccinated with older age, chronic conditions, such as immunosuppression, they can benefit with early treatment with an antiviral for reduction in the progression of disease and admission to hospital. WHO has three recommendations for those patients now, a strong recommendation for nemaltavir or ritonavir and conditional ones for molnupiravir or remdesivir. But for those with sepsis and severe and critical conditions and COVID-19, we've had more data for those 
immunomodulator interventions since early on in the pandemic, and these have been life-saving. WHO currently has recommendations, strong ones, for corticosteroids, IL-6 receptor blockers such as tocilizumab and cerilizumab, and Janus kinase inhibitors such as baricitinib. But as I say, of these life-saving recommendations, that life-saving treatments that we now have for severe um, COVID-19 and sepsis in COVID-19, we must be careful not to overuse antibiotics. And I wanted to mention that because antimicrobial resistance is a risk and the overuse of antibiotics in patients with COVID-19 has been well described and uh, interventions to reduce this uh, need to be also made. Finally, follow-up post-recovery. As in all patients with sepsis, follow-up post-recovery is essential. And in COVID-19, we have seen post-COVID-19 condition uh, as commonly known as long COVID. And this needs to be uh, monitored, but not just, again, not just in the patients that develop sepsis. This is also being reported in patients who have mild or early uh, disease that don't develop the sepsis complications. So post-acute care is important in the community and hospital care pathways. So in conclusion, now that we have new tools for COVID-19 on top of our previous sepsis tools, we have what it takes to prevent and treat to save lives and reduce morbidity from SARS-CoV-2 infection. This know-how and tools, vaccines, diagnostics, treatments, now need to be distributed equitably around the world to make this patient impact. And that is what WHO and its partners and collaborators um, are committed to do. And we look forward uh, to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Diaz. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Professor Heli Prescott. She's an associate professor in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor Veterans Affairs Hospital. She is vice chair of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines and a council member of the International Sepsis Forum. Uh, her expertise is long-term outcomes and recovery after sepsis and COVID-19. She is going to speak about the novel insights in the pathophysiology of sepsis and its sequelae by COVID-19. And and I think she also doesn't have any slides. Thank you, uh, Professor Prescott. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's really an honor to speak at the World Sepsis Congress. I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together such an excellent program and for having me on this panel. Uh, I've been asked to speak about what COVID has taught us about sepsis. And so I reflected a little bit about what I was taught about sepsis back in medical school. And one of the key things that I was taught is that sepsis is triggered by infection, but that the key driver of sepsis is the dysregulated host response to infection. And this host response was felt to be more important than the inciting infection because some patients uh, experience progressive organ dysfunction and death, even despite successful treatment and eradication of that inciting infection. And so there's been much attention to the dysregulated host response, but dozens of trials targeting the host response in all-cause sepsis had been negative. And the heterogeneity of sepsis was often cited as a reason why these trials had been negative. And so there've been many attempts to identify subgroups, subphenotypes of sepsis to enrich clinical trials, but I think there hasn't been great consensus on how to do that. Um, how do we go about identifying meaningful subgroups or subtypes or which of the many different um, sort of subgroups or subtypes proposed are sort of the best that we should incorporate into our clinical practice? Since the pandemic, however, we have all been studying severe and critical COVID. Uh, this is essentially studying all patients who have sepsis due to a single viral infection. And since taking this approach, we have identified several beneficial therapies, including dexamethasone and tocilizumab. So I think a key finding of the pandemic is that the inciting infection really is important. Um, this may be a key driver to the heterogeneity of sepsis and heterogeneity in that host, this regulated host response. And that going forward, we may have better success at identifying effective targeted therapies if we focus on sepsis due to specific infections. As for sequelae of sepsis, the sheer number of people experiencing COVID and longer-term morbidity after COVID have raised awareness of post-sepsis sequelae and highlighted the need for further research in this space. Um, however, I think we still know very little about the underlying biological mechanisms driving longer-term sequelae after COVID or sepsis more broadly, and much more work is needed in that space. 
Um, my time is uh, coming to end, so I'll wrap up now. Again, I think the key learning is the importance of that inciting infection in terms of explaining some of the heterogeneity and being a sort of a meaningful way to study subtypes of sepsis. I'd like to thank you all for listening and really looking forward to joining the panel discussion shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prescott. Uh, so now I'll introduce Dr. Abdulela al uh, and a very important topic. It's uh, the role of policymakers and media for awareness and management of pandemics and sepsis. Uh, Dr. Abdullah is American and Canadian both certified general surgeon with subspeciality in transplant and hepatobiliary surgery. He's a board member and vice president of Global Sepsis Alliance and a member of the World Health Organization's World Patient Safety Day Steering Committee. Dr. Al Hawawi was the founding director general of the Saudi Patient Safety Center and Ministry of Health advisor on patient safety and has helped introduce patient safety as G20 priority in 2020 G20 Saudi Arabia. So welcome, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hashmi. Uh, Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be uh, talking to you today about, uh, you know, uh, the, the the role of policymakers and and, and media uh, during pandemics and 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 sepsis. So, I start off by you know just stating the fact that you know, given the speed and the uncertainty and complexity of pandemics, both policymakers and media have a big role to play. So uh, if we want to start with, with, with policymakers, you know, ideally policymakers should have had an implemented an, an effective surveillance mechanism uh, in place that has prompt and early recognition of pandemics. And healthcare systems, uh, you know, we, we've seen how, how they struggled uh, with, with, with the pandemics. Healthcare systems should have had an effective business continuity plans in place so while responding to, to, uh, to COVID and other pandemics, uh, you wanna make sure that this does not compromise the healthcare delivery uh, to vulnerable patients like you know, cancer patients and you know, children and, and the elderly. Uh, another important part is the effective communication throughout the healthcare system, you know, starting from uh, you know, facility-wide, city-wide, regional and national level. And, I just want to add one word regarding sepsis uh, for policymakers, and I'm, I'm going to uh, advocate now for the World Health Assembly Resolution 70.7. For policymakers, to, they have a great resource in that resolution uh, that they could use uh, you know, during pandemics and outside of pandemics. And I, and I, and I hope that we will have also an opportunity to, to discuss uh, some aspects of the of the of the resolution but I think uh, that that is a very important uh, part as, as far as the policymakers are concerned in in, in terms of uh, uh, you know combating uh, and, and and leading the sepsis efforts uh, in in countries uh, when it comes to media media now is is uh, and, and we've seen how media played uh, an important role, but sometimes also a confusing role because uh, it is it is a it is a big platform. You know, there isn't that one 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 kind of media. There are all these different kinds of media, especially the social media, and and uh, you know the responsibility of the media to be agile uh, and responding to these changing uh, uh, pace of, of of information. Uh, and they have to have, you know, the responsibility to give people access to the correct and evidence-based information. We've, we've, we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, the, 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 the volume and the speed of, 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 of uh, some of the faults or the misinformation that are coming out. And I, and I think uh, it's important for, for media to keep uh, reminding uh, the public that, about the, uh, you know, the official and the evidence-based uh, sources uh, so, so people can make their own uh, and, 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 and the correct decision. So I'll, I'll stop here and I look forward to uh, the opportunity for Q&A during the, uh, you know, uh, the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And uh, now we move on to our fourth panelist, Professor Reedman. He's going to speak about the challenges to evaluate novel therapeutic approaches during pandemic. Professor Reedman is a board certified general surgeon and has served as vice director of intensive care medicine at Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, Germany. He has a vast experience in biotech industry and drug development, as well as complement immunology research. He founded a company in 2007 and is chief executive of Infla. Uh, I'm not too sure how to pronounce the name of the company. I'm sure Professor Reedman will speak about it. He currently serves as a co-chair of the Health Politics Working Group of Bio Deutschland. So welcome, Professor Reedman. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you, Dr. Hashmi, for um, inviting and for chairing this session. Thank the organizers. Uh, really, it's, it's a great uh, experience, but also a great opportunity to bring people together uh, if like at what we all feel like kind of the end, but we all know it's not kind of not the end of a pandemic with, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Diaz um, related to that, which still causes a lot of death. What I'm trying to do in this, in this short here introductory statement is I wanna uh, share some two key learnings uh, on the backbone of um, a global study that we just conducted. And the one is that we are here all talking about sepsis and, and hey, they did a fantastic job in, in, in explaining what that really means. But sepsis and uh, the word COVID-19 have not been merged by many policymakers, by governments, by funding agencies. And that is a learning that I had to, to go through. So people do not know and are not fully aware that COVID-19 patients die of multi-organ failure in sepsis because of the immune response. The second key learning is um, I, we, we're talking a lot about pandemic preparedness right now. And I would like to add one aspect where I can speak to because of my experience now is we're really not prepared on a, on a pure executional level to research drugs in a pandemic. And I want to give a little bit meat to the, to the two bones here. So we just very recently, uh, uh, two weeks ago, basically uh, publicly announced that we completed uh, what we believe is the largest global study uh, as a one-to-one -one randomized placebo-controlled study in intubated and severely uh, sick patients um, with a new mode of action. Um, and for that, we went to several countries in Europe, um, including Germany, Netherlands, and others, uh, Belgium, France, um, but also to Mexico, to Brazil, to Peru, to South Africa, to Russia. So we really had a rather global approach and, and we are a very small team. So we enrolled um, roughly 370 patients into this trial. And um, it was a real endeavor to do that because what we realized that even on an each country level and even in countries where the word pandemic preparedness has been used before and there are programs like in Germany, we're not really prepared to execute high quality trials. I'm personally a very big believer that we need one-to-one -one randomized placebo controlled trials to really understand whether a drug works and how it works. Now, I know that we had some very important discoveries in non-controlled tr large trials where we put a lot of patients in, but they always left this like, uh, like cloud of doubt whether the data are reproducible and oftentimes they have not been reproduced in other studies. So the question really is, how can we get to research new drugs? And I can tell you that my experience is the key hurdles are, there's no co collaboration between countries. There's completely different ethical standards. Even within each country, uh, there are countries where this is solved well, to give an example, France, but there are countries where this is not solved well, like in Germany, you have different views at every hospital, what should be done from an ethical perspective. You have different views, what should be done to start the trial. Sometimes it takes five months in a pandemic to start a center and rolling with a very motivated investigator uh, because of regulatory hurdles. And so what I would like to cast my vote in for is if we talk about pandemic preparedness, there are many facets and many important areas that we need to discuss and just want to put my head in the ring for one, let's try to get the right, uh, I would say, um, structural uh, um, prerequisites together to conduct fast studies 
with the sites that are engaged in different countries so that we don't start talking about, is it ethical to enroll a patient on a ventilator or uh, what's the right wording in an informed consent? These are all problems that could be solved internationally and could really prepare us to, to start a study within two weeks and not within five months and to enroll patients. So that would be my concluding statement. I thank you very much for allowing me to make this statement. I'm happy to uh, also uh, get more engaged in the panel discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting topic and we'll have a rich discussion at the end of this. So now I'm going to introduce our last uh, panelist, Professor Flavia Mercado. She's a professor of intensive care and chair of intensive care section of anesthesiology, pain and intensive care department at the Federal University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She is uh, a member of LASI, which is Latin American Sepsis Institute since 2005. She's also a member of Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, International Guidelines and a member of Executive Board of Global Sepsis Alliance. She's very active in research in her uh, region. She's um, a member of BRICNET and LIVIN, which is Latin American Intensive Care Network. She has published more than 180 uh, uh, scientific paper. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Makata. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in this uh, high quality panel. I uh, would address your point and I'm going to use the slides because I want to show some maps. So what had we learned with COVID in low and middle income countries that we can use later uh, on our sepsis trials? I think that uh, one of the most important things that we learned is the fundamental role of networking. And I think that you already addressed this a little bit. So I think that we had the opportunity to uh, build networks in our, in our countries or to enhance those that, there were, that were already there. For instance, in Brazil, BrickNet uh, did good uh, studies, not alone, but again, together with other stakeholders inside Brazil. So it was a great opportunity to learn how to work together. This inside the countries, but I think that the most important thing we learn is that we need to go for the platform trials, the international uh, uh, multi-center platform trials, like for instance, REMAPCAT, uh, Recovery and Solidarity. However, there is a problem. We learned this, but we are not actually, I think, practicing this, not yet. For instance, on REMAPCAT, we have more than 350 sites and we have only a couple of sites in Pakistan uh, and Nepal in India, and once only one site in South America. So low and middle countries are not really represented here. And uh, we have the same problem with recovery, uh, where we have almost 200 sites, and only 80 of them are from low and middle income countries, including really, really very small parts of the biggest things that this platform has done. Of course, we have solidarity. Uh, we can discuss this with Janet later. Solidarity is much more uh, broad in his uh, in the way that it was built. It's from health, all health organizations. We have a lot of representation from low and middle income countries. And we know that this increased the generalizability of the results that we found in the trials. However, uh, the, the publication track of remap and recovery is quite different from solidarity. So we need to learn more and to see what can we do better on putting together uh, all the efforts that we did in COVID and now try to keep this going with sepsis trials. Uh, a second point that I think it's important and Neil also addressed this is that although it's not okay, we really try to optimize our regulatory tracks it was worse before the pandemic. Now it's a little bit better, I think, in some countries. So we learned that we need to go faster if you want to do good research during pandemics. There is a third aspect that is related to the ethics perception. And I think that here we have two things. One is related to us, uh, to how people did this research. Uh, in Brazil, I can easily uh, mention at least two very bad examples to how to conduct a trial ethically. So we have the opportunity to have unethical studies during a pandemic. So we need to 
also learn from this and how to avoid unethical research during the pandemic. And uh, we also have uh, a, a better approach on how and can we conduct ethical studies coming from high-income countries and low-income countries. For instance, the best example would be how to still go for uh, possible vaccine trials in low- and middle-income countries while high-income countries are already receiving vaccines. For sure, we learn a lot in our settings on how to improve the digital health tools. So now much more, we had to build up paperless ICUs very quickly. And this also have helped in doing research. We have better electronic and health records. We have better strategies for training, for uh, education. We have better strategies, for instance, monitoring uh, uh, from the distance, uh, uh, all the, the things from research. And certainly, I think that the most important lesson that we learned uh, in doing this pandemic was uh, the re resilience, how to conduct research, how to do good trials, how to produce all this knowledge while we were fighting against COVID. So uh, uh, we learn a lot and we need to go further using all this knowledge to fight sepsis. Thank you, Thank you, everyone, all the panelists for your initial statements, which uh, will, uh, which has initiated many questions from the uh, from the audience. So I think we'll go through the questions um, one by one. The first question is for Dr. Prescott. Uh, somebody has asked that I've always been disturbed by the comment that sepsis is due to a disturbed or abnormal response to infection. I'm now more convinced than ever that it is not due to an abnormal response. I believe that sepsis is the evolutionary natural response to infection. So how would the panelists respond to that? Um, I'll chime in and say that I, I completely agree with that. I think that, you know, this nation, uh, this notion of a dysregulated host response, we really don't have a definition of what that dysregulation really means. There's no biomarker to you know, say, oh, yes, this is dysregulated. Um, and I completely agree, right? We have evolved to be how we are. So my sense has always been it's been collateral damage. The body is doing the best it can, but collateral damage happens in the process of that. So when I think about sepsis, I think about it as that that host response has resulted in damage to patients' tissues and organs. That doesn't mean that there is kind of like a better way that that patient could have been. May I jump in? Yes, with please. Remark. So to, to Haley's remark here, uh, I completely agree. And also to the comment, there's no definition for dysregulated. But if you look at the complement levels that we found, C5A levels in these patients, they are so abnormally high, there are levels that if you induce these levels, which you can experimentally do in mice, they will die. And you may not call it dysregulated. I also believe it's the natural response. It's kind of an all or nothing response to a very severe insult, if you will. But we do have to recognize that that response can kill us too. And as, as long as we can agree on this, I think the rest is semantics. <laughs> Okay, so somebody had asked, are there going to be new guidelines in uh, 2022? So maybe uh, the panel can recommend change in the definition, which will be a big step. So there's another question um, uh, addressed to uh, Heli, also regarding the definitions. Uh, he has asked, could you comment on the relevance of this definition with regards to newborns? Do you think we are any closer to eliciting a definition for neonatal sepsis? It seems critical to reach consensus on this alongside moving forward into novel diagnostics. Yeah, I mean, so the way that I think about sepsis is kind of on the spectrum, right? So we have lots of interactions with microbes, right? We have like bacteria that live on and within us that are actually part of health, right? 
Then you have uh, microbes that are causing a problem, right? Infection, and your body has kind of a natural response. And a lot of times we can control and treat that infection without having any organ dysfunction, right? And so I think of sepsis as kind of like a line in the sand of when that response to the infection is now also doing damage. It's an injurious host response. Um, and in terms of what that line in the sand is, I feel like that's what we have been, you know, debating over a long time, right? We used to kind of think of that as SERS criteria. But during that sepsis three definition, we kind of came to this realization that no, fever is, you know, kind of like a normal and not necessarily injurious host response. You know, same thing with an elevated heart rate. And so that's why those definitions sort of conceptually changed to acute organ dysfunction, you know, as typically implemented by the SOFA score. But I think there's a lot of work in trying to identify kind of earlier biomarkers, because I think we all know it's a pretty crude measure for organ dysfunction. I think the other challenge is sort of relating that organ dysfunction to the host response, this you know injurious host response. And that, I mean, at this point, the best we have is just kind of like our clinical kind of um, impression based on the full clinical data, that that Organist function is due to infection and not due to some kind of other related thing that also happens to be going on. And, you know, I would love to sort of have a new definition that was better. You know, I'm not sure that we've come far enough that there's kind of like a meaningful difference compared to what was done in 2016. And sort of important to recognize, like sepsis has been around for, you know, thousands of years. And we've been trying to, you know, develop a better or more precise definition. And I think that it's just important to be humble and recognize that it's kind of always an evolution and process. Um, but again, I think that we're kind of still, you know, still at a place where we're, we're pretty similar to where we were in 2016, but open to other opinions from the panelists too. Uh, may, may, I, may I have a comment on this, Madiha? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I think that the problem with the definition on sepsis three, it's, it's not a definition per se. I think that the broad definition that we have organ dysfunction due to the related organ response is actually almost perfect, or at least perfect in our time. And the problem, it is the use of a sofa score that needs lab exams, uh, and uh, these lab exams are not always available in all we need in our country. So still we don't have a sepsis definition that can be practices and used at that side for everyone and that can allow us to have a global measure of the burden of sepsis equally in low and middle income countries and high income countries. So yeah, I fully agree with Kelly that uh, it's a good definition in terms of the broad definition, but I still uh, thinking that we, we need to go further on trying to find a definition that can be used for everyone. And when you go for Kelly, for biomarkers that can detect this earlier in the process, we will just uh, uh, enhance the disparities on the definition that already exist using bilirubin, creatinine, things that we don't have. So I think that the, the solution is to reduce the disparities in the world, but we are not going to achieve this easily. Anyone else would like to comment on the definitions? It's a very hot topic. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, Chris Ghana. Uh, so the question is, with the strong indications that non-COVID sepsis and critical COVID-19 sepsis share common pathophysiology, so the success of corticosteroids and NTIL-6 agents in severe COVID. So should we not be strongly evaluating the role of these agents in sepsis in general? So anybody? Uh, I think NTIL-6 has been evaluated in sepsis in, a, in, in broader trials at some point. Uh, corticosteroids have been evaluated, I think, for 30 years, there was a time where high dose was in and then low dose was in. And that was the time when I was still active as intensivist. And I, I would, so I would, I would dare to say it has been evaluated and it's, it's, um, it's part of the overall confusion, I would say, or sepsis treatment failure um, paradigm. I would, I would start a, a bit differently. And I know that, that that sounds odd to many of you, but I would start to say, to ask another question before I answer this one, 
is it really like, do you really believe that this is a strong proof that, for example, anti-L6 inhibitors work in COVID? There are several trials and the, the one-to-one placebo-controlled ones from Roche didn't show any signal. Uh, there, are, there are data that question this. There, it's, it's a bit different, but still there's controversial data on corticosteroids. So I would, I would say there are, there are signals clearly and they're recommended to use and many people use them, but um, it, it hasn't been tested to a standard that we usually test drugs to make that statement. And so I would, I would dare to say we need more research before we conclude where we can take these drugs. That's my statement. Anybody else? Um, I'm not so sure that I, I, I agree. I think that with corticosteroids, we do have evidence coming from uh, randomized controlled trials uh, from recovery, from Codex, from Brazil. They have different designs, but they did compare placebo with corticosteroids and they did show benefits. Uh, uh, for instance, our trial, they, they don't show benefits in terms of mortality because we did not design this on these terms. But uh, on a whole, when we put all these trials together in a meta-analysis, we, we can find, yes, a benefit with corticosteroids. And maybe it's just because uh, of the different agents that we are dealing with. So I think that COVID is different from endemic sepsis. And uh, I agree with you that we already tested corticosteroids and anti 6 in sepsis, and we could not find uh, any uh, benefit. But maybe uh, the problem is, is again, it's what uh, Heli mentioned. It's the heterogeneity of what we did in the past and what we are still doing with sepsis trials. So for, in COVID, for the first time, we haven't had to deal with the heterogeneity heterogeneity coming from the positive agent. So it was the first time that we had the chance to take this out of the sepsis trials. So uh, I don't think that uh, in corticosteroids, let's remember, they, we have a recommendation to use it on patients that are very severely ill. We just have never, to my knowledge, trial in uh, the proportion that we did with COVID with ARDS from endemic sepsis. We have some studies in influenza, so in higher mortality. We have studies in ARDS, but not a, a power the studies like we had for COVID. So we just need to test it again. So uh, uh, the comment from Ghana is that I don't think the problem is the sa- is the name of the response or the definition. We need to focus on how to recognize these patients early, irrespective of where they find themselves and on what works in treating these patients. So I think this is how the panel uh, concluded as well, that uh, we can't get stuck in the definitions, but we are forced to also. (laughs) Now, the next question is for Dr. Uh, Abdulela. How can policymakers provide a good role in management of sepsis and pandemics as they will be the ones supervising and limiting the media easily? Thank you very much. Uh, if I just wanted, uh, I wanted to, to actually to add to the comment from, from Ghana that, uh, and, and this, is, this is the view of, 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 from a patient safety, you know, sepsis in a way is, is waiting too late. You know, it, uh, you know, as uh, when, when you look at it as a KPI and, and we, we kind of start splitting hairs, it's, it's, it's a failure of the system that you, you reach that far. So I think we need to be also thinking about some uh, leading indicators and, and prevention upstream to, to, to avoid getting into that rather than kind of, you know, getting into the definition of, what, uh, uh, you know, the, the nitty gritty uh, uh, parts. So I think... This is what, 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 what the focus moving forward should be, is on, 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 on prevention upstream rather than kind of waiting uh, toward, towards the end. And I think that takes me to answering the question about the policymakers. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but, you know, in 2017, the, 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 a very good document, which is the, 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 the resolution for sepsis 70.7, uh, came out. Uh, with 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 the, with the great effort of of, of many uh, you know uh, uh, entities and individuals that that push this forward, unfortunately the uptake by governments is still uh, weak, and 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 if we really want to to kind of uh, 
move the needle towards, uh, you know, uh, reducing the number of, uh, you know, the millions of people that die from sepsis on, a, on an annual basis, uh, we, we really need to kind of get a commitment from, from, from governments and from policymakers uh, to, uh, to, to, to kind of uh, follow those uh, uh, items within, within the resolution have clear KPIs on, on the implementation of the, of the different parts of the resolution, have maybe the World Health Assembly, uh, sorry, the, the WHO, uh, and, and, and follow up with, 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 with governments in, you know, kind of regional offices and country offices about uh, the, 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 that, that part of the implementation. I think this is where we fall uh, short. So, and we've seen in, 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 in COVID how, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Machado spoke about uh, resilience. We, we've seen in COVID that actually healthcare systems uh, had difficulties with, with, with resilience. And even, even not just low and middle income countries, but even, uh, you know, high income countries uh, did not do well. And, and that kind of just gives you an idea about uh, how the healthcare systems were, 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 were organized and the solid approach uh, within, within healthcare systems. So I think, uh, uh, why, why do I mention that? Because some of the difficulties that sepsis work is, is facing is, is the fact that it's, it, it needs to be integrated you know, horizontally. The way that we think in healthcare is we've got this verticalized approach. So we've got these different departments, different groups, different whatever, but then since sepsis is a common pathway that starts from all these different, uh, you know, systems or organs, uh, the, the, we, we need to, to kind of break down the silos in, in our approach. Uh, uh, so even within the, the WHO, you've got an, an infection prevention control department, which is a bit separate from the AMR department, which is separate from, you know, uh, uh, other work. So, so we need to kind of uh, uh, revisit this and, and, and try to have, more of an integrated uh, approach uh, in, in, in dealing with, 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 a, with an important issue like sepsis. I, I wanted to just uh, echo a little bit here on the, um, the advice for policymakers about integrated programs, because I do think sepsis, as already was stated, is integrated. And in some, and in some parts of, uh, of the world, we have vertical programs on disease management. So we have malaria program, or we have an HIV program, or we have a tuberculosis program. And we can't have programs for each infectious disease, right? And now that, that now with COVID-19, it's like, okay, don't go, you know, we have COVID-19 program um, work as a vertical pillar, but we really need now as, as things are evolving is really consider now the integrated approach uh, to sepsis care, which takes in many of the vertical programs because the vertical program still exists to accelerate research and those things on that specific topic and, you know, potentially in surveillance on that type but an integrated approach does seem to be the most efficient way to set up primary care systems, emergency care systems, triage systems, so that patients can access our early, you know, recognition, treatment, you know, the whole pathway of care, um, regardless of which disease program, uh, disease they may be um, coming in with uh, initially, be it an infectious disease or be it, you know, someone who came into the hospital with trauma and then developed sepsis. Um, thank you. Janet, when it comes to policy making, obviously you are very uh, you are positioned in WHO, and WHO adopted the sepsis resolution. I just want to ask you, how has it trickled down to uh, low middle income countries? Like, are they adopting it? Are they asking you? Like, what are they doing? Because we don't see any results from a in the, low in the middle context income perspective. Of, and I, I, you know, speaking for uh, for for the organization here, in the context of all the. Um, of all the priorities we've been dealing with in the past, uh, since that resolution, uh, it has been, it, it, we've been heavily focused on the COVID response, as you know, um, and on that health emergency. And in that, uh, although there's been continued ongoing work on sepsis uh, through some of the work streams, some of us were, were mostly focused on, on COVID-19. So I think it's, it's been slower than we had desired, but I think there is a commitment from WHO to, um, accelerate the work on sepsis and really take advantage of the investments made during COVID-19 um, and regarding to the many different parts of sepsis management, both from prevention, through treatment, through recovery, and to apply those uh, similar principles uh, to an integrated sepsis um, approach. Thank you. 
So there's a very interesting comment. How did the diagnosis and prevention of a new disease such as COVID-19 develop and extend to every corner of the planet so quickly and other infections known for so many years and that also cause a large number of deaths take so long? I would say it's been the one time uh, that I can think of where so many people all at once, all around the world, were sort of facing the same challenges. So I think it was... Um, something about this, just the sort of sheer number. I mean, never have I sort of had ICUs where basically every single one of my patients all had the same condition. You turn on the news, you know, it was just everything, right? Uh, especially during that kind of first wave in 2020, everything was COVID, COVID, COVID. So I think it was a little bit of a, just sort of a uniqueness of the situation, I think. Yeah, I, I fully agree. It was a pandemic. Uh, when we have malaria, when we have tuberculosis, when we have dengue, this does not affect the whole world. This just affects us. It's just about the, 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 the part on the, uh, on the, the lower part of the world map. So, uh, and uh, maybe this was the first time that the high income countries faced a challenge that, for instance, Africa faced for the last how many decades with malaria. What's the difference between COVID and malaria? If you take the African perspective, I think it's just this. Now we reach uh, those who can really make a difference at this moment in the world. Yeah, I, I, I would fully agree. I, I think it's really the fact that we all were concerned directly. I, I had a similar discussion with, uh, with a friend and I said, look, if you talk to your neighbor yesterday, and you learn that six hours later, he had a heart attack and he's now in the ICU. You would say, such a bad luck, it's terrible. But if he had talked to you before and now he's intubated as a COVID patient, you would be scared that it happens to you next because you talked to him. And that's really the difference. It, people are directly affected. And I think what Flavia just said makes total sense to me. You know, frankly speaking, in some parts of the world, I would say the privileged parts, just because they're rich countries with very little endemic situations compared to that, we were all at the same time affected. And it, it's, it really probably was propelling it. Um, and, you know, I think you could probably compare it a little bit to when, when HIV was discovered and people were very, very concerned. All of a sudden, there were huge amounts of money released you know, amounts that you could back then not get together for all oncology together. And so I think it's about human, human fear being in the game. And this, I think it never happened to that scale. I would, I would also agree with that. Can I, can I just, uh, you know, add a point about uh, um, in, inequity here, you know, basically the, you know, COVID have, shed the light on, on some, you know, uh, existing uh, uh, challenges and, 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 and inequity between, uh, you know, different parts of the world. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to name, <clears throat> name of, you know, countries, but some, you know, people within, you know, low-income countries uh, that work uh, on, you know, get kind of daily income for, you know, uh, they they for for labor they their response was if i don't work uh, i'm not gonna get uh you know food on the table i'm gonna die my family's gonna die if i if i go out and work you know th th this is during the lockdown where, where where there was all these kind of back and forth between you know stay home because if if you if you get a daily income from labor and you're told to stay home and you're poor uh, the, the response was, I'm going to have to go work, otherwise I'm going to die. And, and uh, if, if I go and, and, and work, and even if I get COVID, there's, I, I, there's still a chance of me surviving. But if I don't put food on the table, then that's, that, that's, a, that's, that's a definite problem for, my, for myself and my family. So, uh, and, and, and I think that, that, that is, a, an, a, a, I think, part of, 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 of the angle of maybe the comment or the question about how such uh, uh, you know uh, 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 how, how how is it that uh, COVID just uh, spread uh, you know rapidly? I mean, it's a pandemic, so that's 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 pretty obvious. 
But I think uh, the, the low middle income countries and, 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 and part of the world uh, are, are also having uh, challenges. And even there are low middle income pockets within high income you know, countries that are also uh, struggling with, with access to health care, struggling with, with, with income. So you cannot separate, you know, health from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, the, the, the economic situation and the social situation. Thank you very much. There's a clinical question. Yeah. The question is regarding that we are using many antibiotics. So we are talking in the context of COVID and sepsis. So the question is that we are using many antibiotics. Which one would you recommend? And then should we use monoclonal antibodies as well? Or the role of monoclonal antibodies? I can respond I presume on septic shock. Of, I can respond on behalf of WHO guidelines. Um, and who's ever asking that question, I do recommend you go to the living guideline on the WHO website, Therapeutics, and there you could see kind of the most up-to-date evidence um, synthesis and how we formulate the recommendation. And it's living, so that means it gets updated. And as you know, more data emerges over time, and we try to stay current. I would, I would say that for antibiotics, if you're saying antibiotics for bacteria, which are aimed at bacteria, that we do not have any recommendations for antibiotics for COVID-19. Now, if you suspect it in WHO guidelines, you'll see this for those patients that are very sick and you're not sure um, potentially that they may have a bacterial infection or you haven't confirmed yet uh, it's, uh, it's SARS-CoV-2 virus, then uh, there may be some uh, empiric antibiotic treatment. But in general, we don't recommend you know, antibiotics for uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection unless you really thought there was a bacterial infection. For the antivirals, um, again, that's an emerging space with new evidence uh, emerged over the past three months, and we just published our living guideline that has recommendations for uh, recommendations for the antivirals, uh, nemaltrevir, ritonavir, remdesivir, and molnupiravir. But those are not for, those are for patients early on in disease, so not for those that are very sick after you know five days of symptoms. And those patients at risk because it's kind of seen the benefit early on disease. So again, read the guideline. It has a lot of details in there that would be helpful. For monoclonal antibodies, uh, we did assess those two as well, those interventions as well, but just two of them. So trovimab and cassivirumab and devimab. And what, uh, although WHO has recommendations for their use also in early disease to prevent hospitalization, that... Um, the concern is the, the non-clinical data that's emerged with Omicron variant. And so there's a lack of neutralizing activity with casirumab and devimab and a re much reduced neutralizing activity with sotrovimab. So if you have that Omicron variant, it's efficacious because it wasn't studied in that patient group. So there's a consideration there that it should be tested, um, that you have to make sure which variant you're treating. And right now, Omicron is what's mostly circulating globally. So, so I think that uh, there's, there's more to keep up with that. We will continue to review the evidence on, on that as well. Um, thank you. So there's a comment, is the world just waiting for organizations like the World Health Organization and CDC to force the implementation of national guidelines for sepsis prevention and early management? So it's a statement, basically, I think, that is the world just waiting for organizations like WHO and CDC to force the implementation of national guidelines for sepsis prevention and early management? We know the guidelines are around since 2012, but the uptake in low middle income countries especially is not uh, very high. So what do you recommend uh, clinicians should do? Can I, can I just uh, just quickly comment here? I, I think th this this is an issue with uh, with with uh, with with implementation. You know, with the implementation gap. So we've we've, we've got we've got very good. Uh, in a way, I think the knowledge gap has been bridged. Uh, uh, you know, fairly well. The the, the problem is. Uh, how how can you uh, bridge the implementation gap? And we all know that the WHO cannot force anything on, on, on any country. It's a, it's a member state organization. It's actually the other way around. It, it, uh, it, it, it conducts the, the, uh, the interest of, of the member states. I think, I think this goes back to uh, member states and it goes back to, to leaders within, within countries uh, to, to champion these efforts and, 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 and push them forward. Uh, you know, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be amazed to know that maybe some countries don't even 
know if you go to the Ministry of Health that uh, there, there is a resolution. So I think uh, we, you have to have a change management, a robust change management strategies within countries to highlight that, uh, you know, to show the urgency, to show the numbers of, of people uh, that are uh, being affected uh, at a country level from, from sepsis, to create that urgency and to show, to show that there is this document that uh, you as a country could, 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 could work with and, and, and have, uh, you know, different uh, groups within countries, uh, uh, scientists, uh, 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 different clinical associations and, and, and work together to, to push this, this agenda forward. So it's actually a bottom up approach, not uh, kind of a top down approach. No, Abdullah, I'm not so sure. Um, I agree. I 100% agree with what you said, that you need to go from the bottom to up. Because without this uh, country initiative from leaders, we will not reach anything. However, I think that we're still lacking a little bit of up-down, you know. I, we still lack a little bit of help from WHO, from uh, the regional alliance, the regional organizations of the WHO, because our governments, they are not prone to listen to us. So, yes, we can, maybe we can do a little bit of both, you know. We, we can use some help from uh, WHO asking and incentivating uh, the countries and uh, spreading the news about the resolution. We need for us, for us, PAHO, for instance, to, uh, uh, asking our governments about this. We, we have this for uh, antimicrobial resistance in uh, WHO. We have this for any other uh, aspects on health that Janet, uh, as Janet said. So I think we need a little bit of help. Without this help, I'm not sure that we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to, not in our settings at least. Thank you very much. Janet, what do you think? No, no I agree and I, I agree with you both. Um, that, uh, you know, and, and I, I do want to acknowledge as well about the, the guideline development. Sometimes, you know, WHO, one of its roles is to, to develop norms and standards for disease management. And, um, and that has been one of the requests to WHO for sepsis, which would look at the various aspects of sepsis. And we also know that there is a robust guideline that was developed by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, most recently published, um, uh, that has good information and, and clinicians, you know, can access that and can use that and adaptation of guidelines, uh, you know, happen at the national level. But WHO is committed to taking a fresh look at the sepsis guideline using, you know, what's been built, building on the, the lessons from surviving sepsis campaign, uh, uh, but, uh, but making a document um, using the norms and standards approach that WHO uses to make a document that can be applicable to all different settings uh, and with that, an implementation approach uh, that can be used or a framework that can be used uh, for um, improving sepsis according to the um, WHA uh, resolution. So, so that is a piece of work that is um, in, in planning an early, an early process. Um, but uh, we hope that will actually help some member states that do rely or you know, look towards WHO's norms and standards uh, versus other uh, organizations or societal standards that are already published. So now I'm going to touch the many, many questions around research. So the first question is to Professor Reedman, what do you believe are the biggest barriers towards implementing worldwide collaboration in gathering data, investing in research and developing national guidelines in every country for prevention and early recognition of sepsis? Oh, that's a difficult question, <laughs> but it's a very good question um, because the question was really in every country and that's exceeding my, I would say, experience and knowledge background. So I, I, for me, it was quite unique as an intensivist and I would love to, you know, have more knowledge in other areas, but I would like to stay where I, where, where I can probably comment. As you know, when you look at sepsis, especially at the, the sepsis we all usually see and treat, this is kind of the intensive care world mostly. And trials in the intensive care world are very complex. You know, just give you an easy uh, example. In a normal study, when you do uh, a, a high quality controlled study, 
the amount of uh, severe adverse events and adverse events are handleable. In, in sepsis, they, have, they happen 10 times a day. And the pure load of a study to conduct in a clean way to really have control over the data is per se a challenge. So we all talked about patient heterogeneity, and that is and has been the biggest issue for trials, which is why I've been thinking whether it doesn't make more sense to really gear sepsis guidelines more to different causes of infection and adopt the guidelines a bit more specifically because an endocarditis is something so different from a urinary tract infection that it's hard to believe that aside from general principles, treat the right antibiotics early, get samples, uh, you know, there may be aspects we're missing. And the same thing accounts for research. So coming back to the question, what I know in my space, it's very important to find settings that for the research part that operate on the same standard of quality. So it doesn't matter if we go to Brazil, to Flavia, or if we go to we did also sites in Russia. I know this, this has been a different time and we concluded the, the enrollment before this terrible war started. But I would like to mention that um, finding and setting up the ICUs that are capable to operate on similar standards was crucial to conduct a trial that actually answer does it work or not. And that is a huge challenge in the intensive care world. Set aside that even if you have similarly equipped and staffed sites, the standards may be very different, right? And in the pandemic, this was a challenge because we had sites that allowed toxilizumab already. Uh, you will see the data maybe later tonight, but uh, the vast majority, almost 100% had corticosteroids in the trial. So we really treated on top. Uh, and many had um, other biologics because we allowed that, because we realized the standards are different. And in COVID, we had COVID-specific local guidelines. So how do you handle that in a global trial? You, you either allow it, or if you say, we can't allow that, people cannot participate because they're in violation to their own guidelines. So I think the first thing to, do, to conduct research is to find settings that allow you to compare. And that is a first huge challenge, and that's purely on the research side. So how do you gain the data? How valid are the data? If you come to the operational side, I have a lot of ideas that I've written a white paper, and we've just published this uh, uh, as we founded an initiative. This was all run through uh, Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Welte here in Germany. We published on the shortcomings on how to conduct trials in Germany in a pandemic situation. So I mentioned different ethics standards and I mentioned very different regulatory standards. Uh, and I would also like to mention that even shipping, you know, we had one country in South America where the stock was for one month in customs because it was closed over, over Christmas. I mean, those are the things you need to anticipate to do studies. And I do think, and maybe I have to talk to, to Janet really about this, I do think at a global level, we can make a much better push to get prepared to even conduct research more globally. Now, to close this whole up, I don't think it will be possible to do that in every country of the world, as I mentioned, because we need comparable standards. And I really believe, and I really, from the bottom of my heart, I'm saying that, you first need to understand in sepsis where your drug has an effect and then research where else can it have an effect. If you do it the other way around, this is what we've done 30 years altogether. We just said sepsis, most of the patients were included 36 to 72 hours after we screened them, which means most of the cytokines are 80% gone and then we treat them with anti-IL-6, but that is gone to 90% in these patients. So the number needed to treat goes up by a thousands. And, and that, that's something we can avoid altogether. But you know, this was a very long answer, and I'm not sure that I even answered the question, but I just gave you some thoughts because it's so difficult. And um, I would say research it first, then roll it out to more countries. Um, I don't think that the world is equal enough, sad to say, that we can do such studies in every place of the world at this point in time. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'll ask Janet to share her recent experience of O2-CoV-2, rolling it out in low-middle-income countries. 
So, so thank you, Madika. And I think uh, the O2 COP2 study, for those of you, is, is actually an observational study in low middle income countries looking at oxygen use and availability in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. So that's an ongoing enrollment. And, and I have to say, I have to agree with, with all these, um, as the colleagues have already discussed, uh, there are challenges so many along the way from, from getting um, the final protocol finished because even because we started afresh, we didn't have a pre-made or generic protocol for this observational study. You know, when, when the oxygen issues um, became obvious at the beginning of the pandemic on how much oxygen was being needed and how that was putting strains and surges on various countries, one in high and in, in more resource, you know, rich countries it happened, and then we saw it happen across the world. We knew that this was a question that needed to be addressed. And actually, oxygen was not, you know, one of those pandemic preparedness interventions uh, prior to that. Like we've been thinking about many other things in pandemic preparedness, but we weren't thinking about oxygen. So, so that's really what inspired this this study. But as described, there was not a generic protocol. It took time to develop that, took time to develop the networks, um, to do the expression of interest, to bring in the study sites, to do the ethics support. And so step by step, it's been you know, uh, one of those things that I think having gone through this experience and the delays in shipping and arrival of you know, tools to do you know, even a pulse oximeter that we were supplying sites. So, so, and that's not doing an interventional study that requires all the regulatory issues around introduction of a new drug. Um, so I can speak to that study. My call, I'm not doing this. I'm not in, responsible for solidarity. That's another team here. But, uh, but I, from, from our perspective here, uh, preparation for research is really key. Uh, there was a meeting, and it's also on the website, that the research and development team talked about research and innovation during pandemics. And it tries to kind of do a kind of a, an approach to all the areas of research that need to advance, at least during a pandemic, which range not just from treatments to vaccinations, to risk communication, to social interventions, to um, supportive care interventions, like, like we're, you know, we, we're talking about here for, um, for sepsis. So really, and then having standardized tool sets the protocols, the case record forms, the core outcome sets so that you can aggregate data across trials and really the networks and the platforms. And as many of you discussed, I think Claudia showed, you know, how many sites does recovery have in low middle income countries or a remap cap that are active and solid. But now that we've built the bees, right? Now that they, they do exist, right? We've worked really, we can't let that go. We, have, we must, you know, stabilize these platforms and these networks, stabilize our approach to making some sort of generic protocols that then can be adapted, um, you know, with the science and the right questions and the right population being tested uh, in the right intervention. But um, how can we do that and build on the, I think, you know, research capacities that were built during this COVID-19, but sustain them. So there's still quite a bit of work to do, but we have building blocks now that I think uh, we need to take advantage of. Thank you very much. A very important question from the patient's uh, perspective, uh, taking part in clinical trials. So the uh, somebody has asked, involving patient representatives in trial design, especially to create a transparent weighing of priorities and ethics is important. What's your view on this? Because patient values about pros and cons can differ, and we should try more actively to build bridges regarding the ethics. Well, well, well I, I think it is uh, Lisa, for the beginning. Yes, I think this is fundamental when uh, we start to think to to see the, this even in our settings. I think that's maybe one Kelly or another person can testify about this on the high income countries where this is quite usual already. Not quite usual, but it, it is happening. I've been part of some trials where I had the opportunity to discuss with patients and family members doing the design of the trial. And I can say that we need to go for this because they have a lot to say. They have a lot to say, not only on the discussion of this design in the trials, but just also in the same aspects, they have a lot to say on guidelines and they have a lot to say uh, on the consensus or what, whatever. So we have the experience, as Holly can also say, uh, on the new surviving sepsis campaign where we did have uh, family and, uh, uh, and patients are giving us advice, for instance, on uh, the outcomes that we had to look for. Uh, so it is it's the other way of the process. So if you're looking at the patients and families to decide which outcomes surviving sepsis campaign will address when we look at the literature, 
it would be much better if uh, these patients and families were heard before the trials were designed. So I think it's gonna, it will happen even more and more uh, on the next, uh, on the future, but it's already happening, it's very quickly. Thank you very much. Somebody has commented, Professor Mercado, your initial statements are very much nailed on point. I think we stand to lose the lessons from COVID-19 if we do not put as much synergy into real equity in health delivery and health research between high-income countries and low-income countries. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is key for the whole planet. We need to learn how to work better together. And it is together, I mean, and to work together, the networks inside the countries. Will, and and I, I also agree that low-income countries have to do this, but now at this moment, it is easier for middle-income countries like Brazil, China, South Africa, and, 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 and India. So to, to work together with high-income countries, we need to be strong inside our own countries. So we need to have a strong networks inside the country. So there is a very nice uh, also initiative on Africa that is led by a group of persons, Shavin Jacob, for instance, is on this group. And they have built this African research network that is starting to work and doing nice, very nice projects on SETIS in each of the domains that are relevant for SETIS in Africa. So if you have this, and we have the, the, the big uh, middle-income countries also with strong networks, then what Neil said is going to happen one day. So I don't think that we are going to have, have research in every single country of the world, but maybe in these countries that are representative of low-income countries and middle-income countries, we will have. And if we are strong, we will be respected by the high-income countries. And they will put us on the steering committees of the trials and not only using our sites to include patients, they will put us to discuss the trial in the steering committees. They will, we will build with them the trials. And this is a change that has to happen. We are not here only to help including patients. We need to change this for we are here to help thinking on how to build good research questions and how to answer them. Anybody from high income country would like to comment on how to involve the low and low middle income countries in clinical trials? Um, I would just like to make one statement. You know, there was this famous study in sub Saharan Africa, uh, Africa related to oxygen delivery during early onset septic shock. And, uh, you know, back then we looked at the data and nobody really could believe what was published i think in the new england journal back then because you know you, you what you understand is if you go to a very limited resources and you're dealing with a very limit a very different environment than you're used to in high income countries you have to really research what you're doing because you may do harm which in your environment you is used to actually help and uh, that, that is something that at least me personally, when I was intensivist, really told me how important the environment is to conduct good research. You know, and I had the privilege, you know, to be at the University of Michigan as a, as a postdoc for many years. And so I did a lot of basic science. And, you know, if you, it, you learn like how difficult it is to control an experiment and how important it is to not get sidetracked by things that you, you know, otherwise would never see. And I just, you know, want to probably promote here that we need research that is focused on these countries and not just try to like put on top of them what we are used to and say, how can we just re research what we always do? We, we, we should have that caution in us to say, Let's respect the resources and really help them to do research within the resources. That's, that's my two cents here. So any comments on the availability of drugs that are used? Because novel drugs are usually not available in low middle income countries. So during clinical trials, obviously, it's very important to have the drugs that you are um, using. So Janet, any comments how WHO can help with such clinical trials? Thank you. I actually, I would have to defer the answer to that question to my colleagues that are doing the solidarity trial um, 
for for more details. But if someone has that question, if you email me, I'm happy to to advance that question. I do think I can only I can comment on access after recommendations. Um, so after the clinical trials are done, uh, even now with recommendations out for for what I already described, uh, access uh, to uh, to antivirals is limited in low middle income countries. Um, and uh, there's a lot of partnerships, the Accelerator uh, Therapeutics Partnership, which has many different agencies supporting, all trying to work on how to make fair pricing of, of drugs you know, publicly available and then supply also visible uh, so that um, member states and countries can you know, start to invest in consideration of, of integrating new uh, therapeutics into care pathways locally um, for, for COVID-19 patients. So I think uh, there is limits um, currently in access and availability to um, prove, you know, drugs that are already recommended by WHO. Thanks. Yes, and I asked that question because uh, in remap gap, so vitamin C and uh, steroids, they're freely available. So we were able to do the remap gap in Pakistan. But when it comes to expensive treatments, obviously it's not an option to do such clinical trials in low middle income countries so a lot of support is needed uh, to do those trials then uh, we have a question uh, for dr reed pen about uh, fluvoxamine so fluvoxamine could be recommended as a management option particularly in resource limited settings for individuals without access to sars cov2 monoclonal antibody therapy or direct antivirals. Is this put into practice yet? Yeah, I, I have no experience with it, so I would really abstain from from giving any recommendation. Or like, I, I'm not sure. Maybe Flavio or Heli, if you guys have experience with that, I, I don't personally. I don't have personal experience, but my impression is it's not being used um, here. That. Um, Again, primarily practicing in the hospital, so have less experience with these medicines that are used kind of earlier on uh, to prevent progression to more severe disease. So then there is one question again to Dr. Reedman. How about more variation or subgroups in trials apart from more collaboration? For example, more than four days of intravenous vitamin C. Yeah, I think this actually, if you look at this, this it's a very good question. It's really becoming a statistical question when you want to implement new approaches. Even and, it, and that really doesn't matter if it's a new drug that has never been approved yet, or if it's a, a known drug that you can use. It, it, as soon as you start building subgroups, you you if they're not pre-specified and and really powered, you're getting in a statistical question whether you see what you see by chance, and. It, you know, when you do research long enough, and I've, I've had the privilege to, to, to do research both basic science, but also as a physician and investigator. I mean, we have seen trials, specifically in sepsis, we saw a trial that was pretty much almost stopped during fertility analysis for overwhelming efficacy. Then the discussion was long, and in the end, it was carried forward, and the lines crisscrossed. Till the end, it looked like there was a slight signal to harm. And when you have seen this in a powered study, you understand how difficult it is if you look at small subgroups that are not pre-specified and look at effects. You know, I do believe that you need to do that to find signals that you then further research. But for an approval, that's sometimes a, a tricky, a tricky thing, you know, and I think from a regulatory point of view, what is astounding to me is that when you look at some of the uh, dossiers, so for example, I just looked at the toxilizumab dossier, approval dossier from the FDA. This is all public information. Uh, back then, there were only uh, three studies available. And even though they were not all in line, you know, regulators were open to approve drugs way far away from the usual standards. And you see that also with remdesivir. I don't know if you noticed, there's this recent phase four study um, uh, published with, with absolutely no effect. And so while I think we all agree that we need to help patients, if, and that's why I put this early vote in for doing high quality trials that give you answers, if you do it, you will see that again and again, that you have an effect, you prove, and in the end, 
when you research it, it, it cannot be repeated. And I think with subgroups, it would play very similarly. So short answer is yes, absolutely important to study it if best pre-specified, but difficult to approve drugs on. Thank you. So there's one more question. While social fear of the pandemic accelerated the resolution of challenges, it also accelerated the process of developing antimicrobial resistance due to antimicrobial overuse. Have you seen the same effect? Uh, I'm not so sure that uh, what accelerated, uh, we have seen a lot of healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance spread in our ICUs. But I'm not so sure that it was overuse of antibiotics alone. On the beginning of the pandemic, we did a lot of this. We did use antibiotics in my every single patient that was admitted in the ICU. But very soon on the process, we uh, realized that this was a wrong thing to do, and we stopped giving antibiotics to COVID patients. However, what happened actually is that all the strains in the ICU the low quality of care that we're providing because we are overcrowded, this increased healthcare associated infections. And when you have healthcare associated infections, you unfortunately have also an increase in multidrug resistance. So I think that we surely we have an increase in multidrug resistance, but I'm not sure that we overuse antibiotics. We just got a very sick population we think uh, that stayed in our ICU for weeks and we have never seen this before. Thank you. Anybody else wants to comment on that? Antimicrobial resistance is a problem, not only high income countries, low income countries as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we probably had a very similar experience to Flavia. In the very beginning, we were using antibiotics on a lot of people. And, and part of that was just the delays in testing and really sort of the lack of availability of testing in that very first um, wave where it would be a week or, you know, before we would get tests back. And so we were sort of operating in the dark. Um, I think as time went on, testing improved, which helped. You know, if you knew your patient had COVID, um, that helped uh, withhold antibiotics. Um, there was also a lot of data published out of that first wave showing how commonly people got antibacterial agents and how sort of discordant that was with the relatively low rate of bacterial co-infection, at least on presentation to the hospital. But I fully agree with Flavia that, you know, we had just all these patients with ARDS. Um, care, you know, definitely declined in the ICUs due to just the overwhelming number of patients, you know, new people sort of being brought in to do ICU care, to expand our ICUs. So all these things that we have been doing uh, really working hard on over, you know, 10, 20 years, the ABCDEF bundle, right, to get people off the ventilator, those things, we all saw that those, you know, declined, I think, around the world. Um, more people were getting things like benzodiazepine infusions. So I think between the illness, severe illness, but also challenges in delivering high quality ICU care resulted in a lot of patients being stuck on the ventilator, stuck in the ICU. And exactly that um, is a environment where we then develop uh, drug-resistant organisms. So I think there was a lot of factors that played into it. But fortunately, I think there's been growing awareness about trying to withhold antibiotics, at least early on during presentation, because bacterial co-infection is rare. So we don't have any more questions coming out. So I'll just ask a question to all the panelists that uh, at the end of this uh, very nice discussion, do we agree that knowledge from COVID-19 will improve sepsis care? and vice versa? Well, I think that uh, the knowledge from COVID will improve sepsis care if we do it properly. I think that we have the chance to profit from everything that we learned from the last two years. I'm not sure that this already happened, but it's in our hands to make it happen. We have the tools. We learn a lot, certainly. We learn a lot with COVID, and we can use it to fight sepsis. But we're still on the run. We are not doing this at this point, but we can and I think not only in uh, clinical management, we have learned a lot. We have learned a lot in research as well. 
because me situated in a low middle income country is never involved in research before but for the last two years all i have done is take part in clinical trials <laughs> gather covid data so i think it has really stimulated uh, both the management the surge the increase in the awareness of about our intensive care generally to public uh, as well as to patients and uh, research was something which uh, we thought is not possible so that is a byproduct of covid pandemic that uh, many countries not previously doing research are doing research now so any last comments from the panelist before we close this session just to echo Flavia that yes, I feel um, unless we close our eyes and close our ears and don't learn anything from COVID, uh, which I don't think we will do, um, that we must uh, take these learnings um, as building blocks and, and really uh, that will impact and improve sepsis care in the future um, in the clinical care approaches and research uh, methods and, and implementation um, across the board. So, so I, am, I am hopeful. Thank you. So thank you very much, all the panelists, for such a rich discussion. We have spent uh, all our time. And thank you for the audience for uh, uh, asking such nice questions that kept the discussion going. Please do uh, sign the World Sepsis Declaration if you have not done so. Visit the uh, website and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I'm very grateful to all the sponsors who have uh, sponsored this session and the conference as well. So thank you very much, everybody. See you.